Number, the language of science. A critical survey written for the cultured non-mathematician by Tobias Danzig, PhD, published in 1930. Part one. Preface. This book deals with ideas, not with methods. All irrelevant technicalities have been studiously avoided, and to understand the issues involved, no other mathematical equipment is required than that offered in the average high school curriculum. But though this book does not presuppose on the part of the reader a mathematical education, it presupposes something just as rare, a capacity for absorbing and appraising ideas. Furthermore, while this book avoids the technical aspects of the subject, it is not written for those who are afflicted with an incurable horror of the symbol, nor for those who are inherently form-blind. This is a book on mathematics. It deals with symbol and form and with the ideas which are back of the symbol or of the form. The author holds that our school curricula by stripping mathematics of its cultural content and leaving a bare skeleton of technicalities, have repelled many a fine mind. It is the aim of this book to restore this cultural content and present the evolution of number as the profoundly human story which it is. This is not a book on the history of the subject, Yet, the historical method has been freely used to bring out the role intuition has played in the evolution of mathematical concepts, and so the story of number is here unfolded as a historical pageant of ideas, linked with the men who created these ideas, and with the epics which produced the men. Can the fundamental issues of the science of number be presented without bringing in the whole intricate apparatus of the science? This book is the author's declaration of faith that it can be done. They who read shall judge. Tobias Danzig, Washington, D.C., May 3rd, 1930. Poincaré. Though the source be obscure, still the stream flows on. Ovid Fasti, 3. Ten cycles of the moon the Roman year comprised. This number then was held in high esteem, because, perhaps, on fingers we are wont to count. Or that a woman in twice five months brings forth, or else that numbers wax till ten they reach, and then from one begin their rhythm anew. Chapter 1. Fingerprints. Man, even in the lower stages of development, possesses a faculty which, for want of a better name, I shall call number sense. This faculty permits him to recognize that something has changed in a small collection when, without his direct knowledge, an object has been removed from or added to the collection. Number sense should not be confused with counting, which is probably of a much later vintage and involves, as we shall see, a rather intricate mental process. Counting, so far as we know, is an attribute exclusively human, whereas some brute species seem to possess a rudimentary number sense akin to our own. At least, such is the opinion of competent observers of animal behavior, and the theory is supported by a weighty mass of evidence. Many birds, for instance, possess such a number sense. If a nest contains four eggs, one can safely be taken, but when two are removed, the bird generally deserts. In some unaccountable way, the bird can distinguish two from three, but this faculty is by no means confined to birds. In fact, the most striking instance we know is that of the insect called the solitary wasp. The mother wasp lays her eggs in individual cells and provides each egg with a number of live caterpillars on which the young feed when hatched. Now, the number of victims is remarkably constant for a given species of wasp. Some species provide five, others twelve, others again as high as 24 caterpillars per cell. But most remarkable is the case of the genus Eumenes. 
a variety in which the male is much smaller than the female. In some mysterious way, the mother knows whether the egg will produce a male or a female grub and apportions the quantity of food accordingly. She does not change the species or size of the prey, but if the egg is male, she supplies it with five victims, if female, with ten. The regularity of the action of the wasp, and the fact that this action is connected with a fundamental function in the life of the insect, make this last case less convincing than the one which follows. Here the action of the bird seems to border on the conscious. A squire was determined to shoot a crow which made its nest in the watchtower of his estate. Repeatedly he had tried to surprise the bird, but in vain, at the approach of man the crow would leave its nest. From a distant tree it would watchfully wait until the man had left the tower and then return to its nest. One day the squire hit upon a ruse. Two men entered the tower, one remained within, the other came out and went on, but the bird was not deceived. It kept away until the man within came out. The experiment was repeated on the succeeding days with two, three, then four men, yet without success. Finally, five men were sent. As before, all entered the tower, and one remained, while the other four came out and went away. Here the crow lost count. Unable to distinguish between four and five, it promptly returned to its nest. Two arguments may be raised against such evidence. The first is that the species possessing such a number sense are exceedingly few, that no such faculty has been found among animals, and that even the monkeys seem to lack it. The second argument is that in all known cases the number sense of animals is so limited in scope as to be ignored. Now the first point is well taken. It is indeed a remarkable fact that the faculty of perceiving number, in one form or another, seems to be confined to some insects and birds and to men. Observation and experiments on dogs, horses, and other domestic animals have failed to reveal any number sense. As to the second argument, it is of little value, because the scope of the human number sense is also quite limited. In every practical case where civilized man is called upon to discern number, he is consciously or unconsciously aiding his direct number sense. With such artifices as symmetric pattern reading, mental grouping or counting, counting especially has become such an integral part of our mental equipment that psychological tests on our number perception are fraught with great difficulties. Nevertheless, some progress has been made. Carefully conducted experiments lead to the inevitable conclusion that the direct visual number sense of the average civilized man rarely extends beyond four, and that the tactile sense is still more limited in scope. Anthropological studies on primitive peoples corroborate these results to a remarkable degree. They reveal that those savages who have not reached the stage of finger counting are almost completely deprived of all perception of number. Such is the case among numerous tribes in Australia, the South Sea Islands, South America, and Africa. Kerr, who has made an extensive study of primitive Australia, holds that but few of the natives are able to discern four, and that no Australian in his wild state can perceive seven. The Bushmen of South Africa have no number words beyond one, two, and many, and these words are so inarticulate that it may be doubted whether the natives attach a clear meaning to them. We have no reasons to believe, and many reasons to doubt, that our own remote ancestors were better equipped, since practically all European languages bear traces of such early limitations. The English thrice, just like the Latin ter, has the double meaning three times and many. There is a plausible connection between the Latin tres, three, and trans, beyond. The same can be said regarding the French tre, 
very, and trois, three. The genesis of number is hidden behind the impenetrable veil of countless prehistoric ages. Has the concept been born of experience, or has experience merely served to render explicit what was already latent in the primitive mind? Here is a fascinating subject for metaphysical speculation, but for this very reason beyond the scope of this study. If we are to judge the development of our own remote ancestors by the mental state of contemporary tribes, we cannot escape the conclusion that the beginnings were extremely modest. A rudimentary number sense, not greater in scope than that possessed by birds, was the nucleus from which the number concept grew. And there is little doubt that, left to his direct number perception, man would have advanced no further in the art of reckoning than the birds did. But through a series of remarkable circumstances, man has learned to aid his exceedingly limited perception of number by an artifice which was destined to exert a tremendous influence on his future life. This artifice is counting, and it is to counting that we owe the extraordinary progress which we have made in expressing our universe in terms of number. There are primitive languages which have words for every color of the rainbow, but have no word for color. There are others which have all number words, but no word for number. The same is true of other conceptions. The English language is very rich in native expressions for particular types of collections. Flock, herd, set, lot, and bunch apply to special cases. Yet the words collection and aggregate are of foreign extraction. The concrete preceded the abstract. It must have required many ages to discover, says Bertrand Russell, that a brace of pheasants and a couple of days were both instances of the number two. To this day we have quite a few ways of expressing the idea two, pair, couple, set, team, twin, brace, etc., etc. A striking example of this extreme concreteness of the early number concept is the Thymshian language of a British Columbia tribe. There we find seven distinct sets of number words. One for flat objects and animals, one for round objects and time, one for counting men, one for long objects and trees, one for canoes, one for measures, one for counting when no definite object is referred to. The last is probably a later development, the others must be relics of the earliest days when the tribesmen had not yet learned to count. It is counting that consolidated the concrete and therefore heterogeneous notion of plurality. So characteristic of primitive man into the homogeneous abstract number concept, which made mathematics possible. Yet, Strange though it may seem, it is possible to arrive at a logical, clear-cut number concept without bringing in the artifices of counting. We enter a hall. Before us are two collections, the seats of the auditorium and the audience. Without counting, we can ascertain whether the two collections are equal and, if not equal, which is the greater. For if every seat is taken and no man is standing, we know without counting that the two collections are equal. If every seat is taken and some in the audience are standing, we know without counting that there are more people than seats. We derive this knowledge through a process which dominates all mathematics and which has received the name of one-to-one -one correspondence. It consists in assigning to every object of one collection an object of the other, the process being continued until one of the collections, or both, are exhausted. The number technique of many primitive peoples is confined to just such a matching or tallying. They keep the record of their herds and armies by means of notches cut in a tree or pebbles gathered in a pile. 
That our own ancestors were adept in such methods is evidenced by the etymology of the words tally and calculate, of which the first comes from the Latin talia, cutting, and the second from the Latin calculus, pebble. It would seem at first that the process of correspondence gives only a means for comparing two collections, but is incapable of creating number in the absolute sense of the word. Yet the transition from relative number to absolute is not difficult. It is necessary only to create model collections, each typifying a possible collection. Estimating any given collection is then reduced to the selection among the available models of one which can be matched with the given collection member by member. Primitive man finds such models in his immediate environment. The wings of a bird may symbolize the number two, clover leaves three, the legs of an animal four, the fingers on his own hand five. Evidence of this origin of number words can be found in many a primitive language. Of course, once the number word has been created and adopted, it becomes as good a model as the object it originally represented. The necessity of discriminating between the name of the borrowed object and the number symbol itself would naturally tend to bring about a change in sound, until in the course of time the very connection between the two is lost to memory. As man learns to rely more and more on his language, the sounds supersede the images for which they stood and the originally concrete models take the abstract form of number words. Memory and habit lend concreteness to these abstract forms, and so mere words become measures of plurality. The concept I just described is called cardinal number. The cardinal number rests on the principle of correspondence. It implies no counting. To create a counting process, it is not enough to have a motley array of models, comprehensive though this latter may be. We must devise a number system. Our set of models must be arranged in an ordered sequence, a sequence which progresses in the sense of growing magnitude, the natural sequence, one, two, three. Once this system is created, counting a collection means assigning to every member a term in the natural sequence in ordered succession, until the collection is exhausted. The term of the natural sequence assigned to the last member of the collection is called the ordinal number of the collection. The ordinal system may take the concrete form of a rosary but this, of course, is not essential. The ordinal system acquires existence when the first few number words have been committed to memory in their ordered succession, and a phonetic scheme has been devised to pass from any larger number to its successor. We have learned to pass with such facility from cardinal to ordinal number that the two aspects appear to us as one. To determine the plurality of a collection, i.e. its cardinal number, we do not bother any more to find a model collection with which we can match it, we count it. And to the fact that we have learned to identify the two aspects of number is due our progress in mathematics. For whereas in practice we are really interested in the cardinal number, this latter is incapable of creating an arithmetic. The operations of arithmetic are based on the tacit assumption that we can always pass from any number to its successor. And this is the essence of the ordinal concept. And so matching by itself is incapable of creating an art of reckoning. Without our ability to arrange things in ordered succession, little progress could have been made. Correspondence and succession, the two principles which permeate all mathematics, nay, all realms of exact thought, are woven into the very fabric of our number system.
It is natural to inquire at this point whether this subtle distinction between cardinal and ordinal number had any part in the early history of the number concept. One is tempted to surmise that the cardinal number, based on matching only, preceded the ordinal number, which requires both matching and ordering. Yet the most careful investigations into primitive culture and philology fail to reveal any such precedents. Wherever any number technique exists at all, both aspects of number are found. But also, wherever a counting technique, worthy of the name, exists at all, finger counting has been found to either precede it or accompany it. And in his fingers, man possesses a device which permits him to pass imperceptibly from cardinal to ordinal number. Should he want to indicate that a certain collection contains four objects, he will raise or turn down four fingers simultaneously. Should he want to count the same collection, he will raise or turn down these fingers in succession. In the first case, he is using his fingers as a cardinal model, in the second as an ordinal system. Unmistakable traces of this origin of counting are found in practically every primitive language. In most of these tongues, the number 5 is expressed by hand, the number 10 by two hands, or sometimes by man. Furthermore, in many primitive languages, the number words up to four are identical with the names given to the four fingers. The more civilized languages underwent a process of attrition which obliterated the original meaning of the words. Yet here, too, fingerprints are not lacking. Compare the Sanskrit pancha, five, with the related Persian pencha, hand, the Russian piat, Five, with piast, the outstretched hand. It is to his articulate ten fingers that man owes his success in calculation. It is these fingers which have taught him to count and thus extend the scope of number indefinitely. Without this device, the number technique of man could not have advanced far beyond the rudimentary number sense and it is reasonable to conjecture that without our fingers, the development of number, and consequently that of the exact sciences, to which we owe our material and intellectual progress, would have been hopelessly dwarfed. And yet, except that our children still learn to count on their fingers, and that we ourselves sometimes resort to it as a gesture of emphasis, finger counting is a lost art among modern civilized people. The advent of writing, simplified numeration, and universal schooling have rendered the art obsolete and superfluous. Under the circumstances, it is only natural for us to underestimate the role that finger counting has played in the history of reckoning. Only a few hundred years ago, finger counting was such a widespread custom in Western Europe that no manual of arithmetic was complete unless it gave full instructions in the method. The art of using his fingers in counting and in performing the simple operations of arithmetic was then one of the accomplishments of an educated man. The great ingenuity was displayed in devising rules for adding and multiplying numbers on one's fingers. Thus, to this day, the peasant of central France uses a curious method for multiplying numbers above five. If he wishes to multiply nine by eight, he bends down four fingers on his left hand, four being the excess of nine over five, and three fingers on his right hand, eight minus five equaling three. Then the number of the bent down finger gives him the tens of the result, four plus three equals seven, while the product of the unbent fingers gives him the units, 1 times 2 equals 2. Artifices of the same nature have been observed in widely separated places, such as Bessarabia, Serbia, and Syria. Their striking similarity in the fact that these countries were all at one time parts of the great Roman Empire lead one to suspect the Roman origin of these devices. 
Yet, it may be maintained with equal plausibility that these methods evolved independently, similar conditions bringing about similar results. Even today, the greater portion of humanity is counting on fingers. To primitive man, we must remember, this is the only means of performing the simple calculations of his daily life. How old is our number language? If it is impossible to indicate the exact period in which number words originated, yet there is unmistakable evidence that it preceded written history by many thousands of years. One fact we have mentioned already, all traces of the original meaning of the number words in European languages, with the possible exception of five, are lost. And this is the more remarkable, since, as a rule, number words possess an extraordinary stability. While time has wrought radical changes in all other aspects, we find that the number vocabulary has been practically unaffected. In fact, this stability is utilized by philologists to trace kinships between apparently remote language groups. The reader is invited to examine the table at the end of the chapter where the number words of the standard Indo-European languages are compared. Why is it then that in spite of this stability, no trace of the original meaning is found? Plausible conjecture is that while number words have remained unchanged since the days when they originated, the names of the concrete objects from which the number words were borrowed have undergone a complete metamorphosis. As to the structure of the number language, philological researches disclose an almost universal uniformity. Everywhere the ten fingers of man have left their permanent imprint. Indeed, there is no mistaking the influence of our ten fingers on the selection of the base of our number system. In all Indo-European languages, as well as Semitic, Mongolian, and most primitive languages, the base of numeration is ten, i.e. there are independent number words up to ten, beyond which some compounding principle is used until one hundred is reached. All these languages have independent words for 100 and 1,000, and some languages for even higher decimal units. There are apparent exceptions, such as the English 11 and 12, or the German Elf and Zwolf, but these have been traced to Einlif and Zulif, Lif being Old German for 10. It is true that in addition to the decimal system, two other bases are reasonably widespread, but their character confirms to a remarkable degree the anthropomorphic nature of our counting scheme. These two other systems are the quinary, base 5, and the vigesimal, base 20. In the quinary system, there are independent number words up to 5, and the compounding begins thereafter. It evidently originated among people who had the habit of counting on one hand. But why should man confine himself to one hand? A plausible explanation is that primitive man rarely goes about unarmed. If he wants to count, he tucks his weapon under his arm, the left arm as a rule, and counts on his left hand, using his right hand as a checkoff. This may explain why the left hand is almost universally used by right-handed people for counting. Many languages still bear the traces of a quinary system, and it is reasonable to believe that some decimal systems passed through the quinary stage. Some philologists claim that even the Indo-European number languages are of a quinary origin. They point to the Greek word pempazain, to count by fives, and also to the unquestionably quinary character of the Roman numerals. However, there is no other evidence of this sort, and it is much more probable that our group of languages passed through a preliminary vigesimal stage. This latter probably originated among the primitive tribes who counted on their toes as well as on their fingers. A most striking example of such a system is that used by the Maya Indians of Central America. 
of the same general character was the system of the ancient Aztecs. The state of the Aztecs was divided into 20 hours. A division of the army contained 8,000 soldiers, 8,000 equaling 20 by 20 by 20. While pure vigesimal systems are rare, there are numerous languages where the decimal and the vigesimal systems have merged. We have the English score, two score, and three score, the French vingt, and quatre vingt, four by twenty. The old French used this form still more frequently. A hospital in Paris originally built for 300 blind veterans bears the Cain name of Cain's Vaint, 15 score. The name Anne's Vaint, 11 score, was given to a corp of police sergeants comprising 220 men. There exists among the most primitive tribes of Australia and Africa a system of numeration which has neither 5, 10, nor 20 for base. It is a binary system, i.e. of base 2. These have not yet reached finger counting. They have independent numbers for 1 and 2, and composite numbers up to 6. Beyond 6, everything is denoted by heap. Cure, whom we have already quoted in connection with the Australian tribes, claims that most of these count by pairs. So strong, indeed, is this habit of the native that he will rarely notice that two pins have been removed from a row of seven. He will, however, become immediately aware if one pin is missing. His sense of parity is stronger than his number sense. Curiously enough, this most primitive of bases had an eminent advocate in relatively recent times in no less a person than Leibniz. A binary numeration requires but two symbols, zero and one, by means of which all other numbers are expressed. The advantages of the base two are economy of symbols and tremendous simplicity in operations. It must be remembered that every system requires that tables of addition and multiplication be committed to memory. For the binary system, these reduce to 1 plus 1 equals 10, and 1 times 1 equals 1. Whereas for the decimal, each table has 100 entries. Yet this advantage is more than offset by lack of compactness. Thus the decimal number 4096 equals 2 to the exponent 12 would be expressed by, in the binary system by 1 trillion. It is the mystic elegance of the binary system that made Leibniz exclaim, Omnibus ex nihil ducendis sufficit unum. One suffices to derive all out of nothing. Says Laplace, Leibniz saw in his binary arithmetic the image of creation. He imagined that unity represented God and zero the void that the Supreme Being drew all beings from the void, just as unity and zero express all numbers in his system of numeration. This conception was so pleasing to Leibniz that he communicated it to the Jesuit, Grimaldi, president of the Chinese Tribunal for Mathematics, in the hope that his emblem of creation would convert the Emperor of China, who was very fond of the sciences. I mention this merely to show how the prejudices of childhood may cloud the vision even of the greatest men. It is interesting to speculate what turn the history of culture would have taken if instead of flexible fingers, man had just two inarticulate stumps. If any system of numeration could at all be developed under such circumstances, it would have probably been of the binary type. That mankind adopted the decimal system is a physiological accident. Those who see the hand of providence in everything will have to admit that providence is a poor mathematician. For outside its physiological merit, the decimal base has little to commend itself. Almost any other base, with the possible exception of nine, would have done as well and probably better. 
Indeed, if the choice of a base were left to a group of experts, we should probably witness a conflict between the practical man, who would insist on a base with the greatest number of divisors, such as twelve, and the mathematician, who would want a prime number, such as seven or eleven, for a base. As a matter of fact, late in the 18th century, the great naturalist Buffon proposed that the duodecimal system, base 12, be universally adopted. He pointed to the fact that 12 has four divisors, while 10 has only two, and maintained that throughout the ages this inadequacy of our decimal system had been so keenly felt that, in spite of 10 being the universal base, most measures had 12 secondary units. On the other hand, the great mathematician Lagrange claimed that a prime base is far more advantageous. He pointed to the fact that with a prime base every systematic fraction would be irreducible and would therefore represent the number in a unique way. In our present numeration, for instance, the decimal fraction 0.36 stands really for many fractions, 36 over 100, 18 over 50, and 9 over 25. Such an ambiguity would be considerably lessened if a prime base such as 11 were adopted. But whether the enlightened group to whom we would entrust the selection of the base decided on a prime or a composite base, we may rest assured that the number 10 would not even be considered, for it is neither prime nor has it a sufficient number of divisors. In our own age, when calculating devices have largely supplanted mental arithmetic, nobody would take either proposal seriously. The advantages gained are so slight, and the tradition of counting by tens so firm that the challenge seems ridiculous. From the standpoint of the history of culture, a change of base, even if practicable, would be highly undesirable. As long as man counts by tens, his ten fingers will remind him of the human origin of this most important phase of his mental life. So may the decimal system stand as a living monument to the proposition, man is the measure of all things. Are you enjoying this reading so far? Welcome to Right Here Audio, the group run by students for students who wish they had someone to read academic literature to them. We read content for anyone who has a hard time reading by themselves. This includes persons with blindness, dyslexia, ADHD, and anyone else who could use some support. Do you have anything you would like us to read for you? Comment down below and we'll get started. For those of you who have supported us since day one, we are so grateful for your support. And if you're new or haven't subscribed yet, join our small community dedicated to increasing accessibility one small step at a time. Now, let's get back to our reading. Chapter 2. The Empty Column Laplace, quote, It is India that gave us the ingenious method of expressing all numbers by means of ten symbols each symbol receiving a value of position as well as an absolute value, a profound and important idea which appears so simple to us now that we ignore its true merit. But its very simplicity and the great ease which it has lent to all computations put our arithmetic in the first rank of useful inventions. And we shall appreciate the grandeur of this achievement the more when we remember that it escaped the genius of Archimedes and Apollonius, two of the greatest men produced by antiquity. The Empty Column As I am writing these lines, there rings in my ears the old refrain, reading, writing, arithmetic, taught to the tune of a hickory stick. In this chapter I propose to tell the story of one of three R's, the one which though oldest, came hardest to mankind. It is not a story of brilliant achievement, heroic deeds, or noble sacrifice. It is a story of blind stumbling and chance discovery, of groping in the dark and refusing to admit the light. It is a story replete with obscurantism and prejudice, 
of sound judgment often eclipsed by loyalty to tradition, and of reason long held subservient to custom. In short, it is a human story. Written numeration is probably as old as private property. There is little doubt that it originated in man's desire to keep a record of his flocks and other goods. Notches on a stick or tree, scratches on stones and rocks, marks in clay. These are the earliest forms of this endeavor to record numbers by written symbols. Archaeological researches trace such records to times immemorial. As they are found in the caves of prehistoric man in Europe, Africa, and Asia. Numeration is at least as old as written language, and there is evidence that it preceded it. Perhaps even the recording of numbers had suggested the recording of sounds. The oldest records indicating the systematic use of written numerals are those of the ancient Sumerians and Egyptians. They are all traced back to about the same epoch, around 3500 BC. When we examine them, we are struck with the great similarity in the principles used. There is, of course, the possibility that there was communication between these peoples in spite of the distances that separated them. However, it is more likely that they developed their enumerations along with the lines of least resistance. It is more likely that they developed their numerations along the lines of least resistance, i.e. that their numerations were but an outgrowth of the natural process of tallying. Indeed, whether it be the cuneiform numerals of the ancient Babylonians, the hieroglyphics of the Egyptian papyri, or the queer figures of the early Chinese records, we find everywhere a distinctly cardinal principle. Each numeral up to nine is merely a collection of strokes. The same principle is used beyond nine, units of a higher class such as tens, hundreds, etc. being represented by special symbols. The ancient tally stick of obscure but probably very ancient origin also bears this unquestionably cardinal character. A schematic picture of the tally is shown in the accompanying figure. Small notches each represent a pound sterling, the larger ones 10 pounds, 100 pounds, etc. It is curious that the English tally persisted for many centuries after the introduction of modern numeration made its use ridiculously obsolete. In fact, it was responsible for an important episode in the history of Parliament. Charles Dickens described this episode with inimitable sarcasm in an address on administrative reform, which he delivered a few years after the incident occurred. Quote, Ages ago, a savage mode of keeping accounts on notched sticks was introduced into the court of Exchequer, and the accounts were kept much as Robinson Crusoe kept his calendar on the desert island. A multitude of accountants, bookkeepers, and actuaries were born and died. Still official routine inclined to those notched sticks as if they were pillars on the Constitution, and still the exchequer accounts continued to be kept on certain splints of elm wood called tallies. In the reign of George III, an inquiry was made by some revolutionary spirit whether pens, ink, and paper, slates and pencils being in existence, this obstinate adherence to an obsolete custom ought to be continued, and whether a change ought not be effected. All the red tape in the country grew redder at the bare mention of this bold and original conception and it took until 1826 to get these sticks abolished. In 1834, it was found that there was a considerable accumulation of them, and the question then arose, what was to be done with such worn-out, worm-eaten, rotten old bits of wood? The sticks were housed in Westminster, and it would naturally occur to any intelligent person that nothing could be easier than to allow them to be carried away for firewood by the miserable people who lived in that neighborhood. However, they had never been useful, and official routine required that they should never be, and so the order went out that they were to be privately and confidentially burned. 
it came to pass that they were burned in a stove in the house of lords. The stove, overgorged with these preposterous sticks, set fire to the panelling. The panelling set fire to the house of commons. The two houses were reduced to ashes. Architects were called in to build others, and we are now in the second million of the cost thereof. As opposed to this purely cardinal character of the earliest records, there is the ordinal numeration, in which the numbers are represented by the letters of an alphabet in their spoken succession. The earliest evidence of this principle is that of the Phoenician numeration. It probably arose from the urge for compactness, brought about by the complexities of a growing commerce. The Phoenician origin of both the Hebrew and the Greek numeration is unquestionable. The Phoenician system was adopted bodily, together with the alphabet, and even the sounds of the letters were retained. On the other hand, the Roman numeration, which has survived to this day, shows a marked return to the earlier cardinal methods. Yet Greek influence is shown in the literal symbols adopted for certain units, such as X for 10, C for 100, M for 1000, but the substitution of letters for the more picturesque symbols of the Chaldeans or the Egyptians does not constitute a departure from principle. The evolution of the numerations of antiquity found its final expression in the ordinal system of the Greeks and the cardinal system of Rome. Which of the two was superior? The question would have significance if the only object of enumeration were a compact recording of quantity. But this is not the main issue. A far more important question is, how well is the system adapted to earth medical operations? And what ease does it lend to calculations? In this respect, there is hardly any choice between the two methods. Neither was capable of creating an arithmetic which could be used by a man of average intelligence. This is why, from the beginning of history until the advent of our modern positional numeration, so little progress was made in the art of reckoning. Not that there were no attempts to devise rules for operating on these numerals, how difficult these rules were can be gleaned from the great awe in which all reckoning was held in these days. A man skilled in the art was regarded as endowed with almost supernatural powers. This may explain why arithmetic from time immemorial was so assiduously cultivated by the priesthood. We shall have occasion later to dwell at greater length on this relation of early mathematics to religious rites and mysteries. Not only was this true of the ancient Orient, where science was built around religion, but even the enlightened Greeks never completely freed themselves from this mysticism of number and form. And to a certain extent, this awe persists to this day. The average man identifies mathematical ability with quickness in figures. So you are a mathematician? Why then have you no trouble with your income tax return? What mathematician has not at least once in his career been so addressed? There is, perhaps, unconscious irony in these words. For are not most professional mathematicians spared all trouble incident to excessive income? There is a story of a German merchant of the 15th century, which I have not succeeded in authenticating, but it is so characteristic of the situation then existing that I cannot resist the temptation of telling it. It appears that the merchant had a son to whom he desired to give an advanced commercial education. He appealed to a prominent professor of a university for advice as to where he should send his son. The reply was that if the mathematical curriculum of the young man was to be confined to adding and subtracting, he perhaps could obtain the instruction in a German university. But the art of multiplying and dividing, he continued, had been greatly developed in Italy, which, in his opinion, was the only country where such advanced instruction could be obtained. As a matter of fact, multiplication and division as practiced in those days had little in common with the modern operations bearing the same names. Multiplication, for instance, was a succession of duplations, 
which was the name given to the doubling of a number. In the same way, division was reduced to mediation, i.e. having a number. A clearer insight into the status of reckoning in the Middle Ages can be obtained from an example using modern notations. We begin to understand why humanity so obstinately clung to such devices as the abacus or even the tally. Computations which a child can now perform required then the services of a specialist, and what is now only a matter of a few minutes meant in the 12th century days of elaborate work. The greatly increased facility with which the average man today manipulates number has been often taken as proof of the growth of the human intellect. The truth of the matter is that the difficulties then experienced were inherent in the numeration in use, enumeration not susceptible to simple, clear-cut rules. The discovery of the modern positional numeration did away with these obstacles and made arithmetic accessible even to the dullest mind. The growing complexities of life, industry, and commerce, of landed property and slaveholding, of taxation and military organization, all called for calculations more or less intricate, but beyond the scope of the finger technique. The rigid, unwieldy numeration was incapable of meeting the demand. How did man, in the 5,000 years of his civilized existence, which preceded modern numeration, counter these difficulties? The answer is that from the very outset, he had to resort to mechanical devices which vary in form with place and age, but are all the same in principle. The scheme can be typified by the curious method of counting an army which has been found in Madagascar. The soldiers are made to file through a narrow passage, and one pebble is dropped for each. When ten pebbles are counted, a pebble is cast into another pile representing tens, and the counting continues. When ten pebbles are amassed in the second pile, a pebble is cast into a third pile representing hundreds, and so on until all the soldiers have been accounted for. From this, there is but one step to the counting board or abacus, which in one form or another has been found in practically every country where a counting technique exists. The abacus in its general form consists of a flat board divided into a series of parallel columns, each column representing a distinct decimal class, such as units, tens, hundreds, etc., the board is provided with a set of counters which are used to indicate the number of units in each class. For instance, to represent 574 on the abacus, four counters are put on the last column, seven counters on the next to the last, and five on the third to the last column. The many counting boards known differ merely in the construction of the columns and in the type of counters used. The Greek and Roman types had loose counters, while the Chinese swan pen of today has perforated balls sliding on slender bamboo rods. The Russian shejidi, like the Chinese variety, consists of a wooden frame on which is mounted a series of wire rods with sliding buttons for counters. Finally, it is more than probable that the ancient Hindu dust board was also an abacus in principle, the part of the counters here being played by erasable marks written on sand. The origin of the word abacus is not certain. Some trace it to the Semitic abac, dust. Others believe that it came from the Greek abax, slab. The instrument was widely used in Greece, and we find references to it in Herodotus and Polybius, the latter commenting on the court of Philip II of Macedonia in his Historia makes this suggestive statement, quote, like counters on the abacus, which at the pleasure of the calculator may at one moment be worth a talent and the next moment a calcus, so are the courtiers at their king's nod at one moment at the height of prosperity and at the next objects of human pity. To this day, the counting board is in daily use in the rural districts of Russia and throughout China, 
where it persists in open competition with modern calculating devices. But in Western Europe and America, the abacus survived as a mere curiosity, which few people have seen except in pictures. Few realize how extensively the abacus was used in their own countries only a few hundred years ago, where after a fashion it managed to meet the difficulties which were beyond the power of a clumsy numeration. One who reflects upon the history of reckoning up to the invention of the principle of position is struck by the paucity of achievement. This long period of nearly 5,000 years saw the fall and rise of many a civilization, each leaving behind it a heritage of literature, art, philosophy, and religion. But what was the next achievement in the field of reckoning, the earliest art practiced by man? An inflexible numeration so crude as to make progress well-nigh impossible, and a calculating device so limited in scope that even elementary calculations called for the services of an expert. And what is more, man used these devices for thousands of years without making a single worthwhile improvement in the instrument, without contributing a single important idea to the system. This criticism may sound severe. After all, it is not fair to judge the achievements of a remote age by the standards of our own time of accelerated progress and feverish activity. Yet, even when compared with the slow growth of ideas during the Dark Ages, the history of reckoning presents a peculiar picture of desolate stagnation. When viewed in this light, the achievement of the unknown Hindu who sometime in the first centuries of our era discovered the principle of position assumes the proportions of a world event. Not only did this principle constitute a radical departure in method, but we know now that without it no progress in arithmetic was possible. And yet the principle is so simple that today the dullest schoolboy has no difficulty in grasping it. In a measure, it is suggested by the very structure of our number language. Indeed, it would appear that the first attempt to translate the action of the counting board into the language of numerals ought to have resulted in the discovery of the principle of position. Particularly puzzling to us is the fact that the great mathematicians of classical Greece did not stumble on it. Is it that the Greeks had such a marked contempt for applied science? leaving even the instruction of their children to the slaves? But if so, how is it that the nation which gave us geometry and carried the science so far did not create even a rudimentary algebra? Is it not equally strange that algebra, that cornerstone of modern mathematics, also originated in India and at about the same time when positional numeration did? A close examination of the anatomy of our modern numeration may shed light on these questions. The principle of position consists in giving the numeral a value which depends not only on the number of the natural sequence it represents, but also on the position it occupies with respect to the other symbols of the group. Thus, the same digit 2 has different meanings in the three numbers 342, 725, and 269. In the first case, it stands for 2, in the second case for 20, in the third for 200. As a matter of fact, 342 is just an abbreviation for 300 plus 4 tens plus 2 units. But that is precisely the scheme of the counting board, where 342 is represented by three notches, four notches, and then two notches. And as I said before, it would seem that it is sufficient to translate this scheme into the language of numerals to obtain substantially what we have today. True, but there is one difficulty. Any attempt to make a permanent record of a counting board operation would meet the obstacle that such an entry as three dashes and two dashes may represent any one of several numbers, 32, 302, 320, 3002, and 3020, among others. In order to avoid this ambiguity, it is essential to have some method of representing the gaps, i.e. what is needed as a symbol for an empty column. 
We see, therefore, that no progress was possible until a symbol was invented for an empty class, a symbol for nothing, our modern zero. The concrete mind of the ancient Greeks could not conceive the void as a number, let alone endow the void with a symbol. And neither did the unknown Hindu see in zero the symbol of nothing. The Indian term for zero was sunya, which meant empty or blank, but had no connotation of void or nothing. And so, from all appearances, the discovery of zero was an accident brought about by an attempt to make an unambiguous permanent record of a counting board operation. How the Indian Sunya became the zero of today constitutes one of the most interesting chapters in the history of culture. When the Arabs of the 10th century adopted the Indian numeration, they translated the Indian Sunya by their own, Sufr, which means empty in Arabic. When the Indo-Arabic numeration was first introduced into Italy, Sufr was Latinized into Zephyrim. This happened at the beginning of the 13th century, and in the course of the next hundred years, the word underwent a series of changes, which culminated in the Italian zero. About the same time Jordanus Nemerarius was introducing the Arabic system into Germany, he kept the Arabic word, changing it slightly to Sifra. That for some time in the learned circles of Europe, the word Sifra and its derivatives denoted zero is shown by the fact that the great Gauss, the last of the mathematicians of the 19th century who wrote in Latin, still used sifra in this sense. In the English language, the word sifra has become cipher and has retained its original meaning of zero. The attitude of the common people toward this new numeration is reflected in the fact that soon after its introduction into Europe, the word sifra was used as a secret sign, but this connotation was altogether lost in the succeeding centuries. The verb decipher remains as a monument of these early days. The next stage in this development saw the new art of reckoning spread more widely. It is significant that the essential part played by zero in this new system did not escape the notice of the masses. Indeed, they identified the whole system with its most striking feature, the sifra, and this explains how this word and its different forms, ziffer, chiffre, etc., came to receive the meaning of numeral, which it has in Europe today. This double meaning, the popular sifra, standing for numeral, and the sifra of the learned signifying zero, caused considerable confusion. In vain did scholars attempt to revive the original meaning of the word. The popular meaning had taken deep root. The learned had to yield to popular usage, and the matter was eventually settled by adopting the Italian zero in the sense in which it is used today. The same interest attaches to the word algorithm. As the term is used today, it applies to any mathematical procedure consisting of an indefinite number of steps, each step applying to the result of the one preceding it. But between the 10th and 15th centuries, algorithm was synonymous with positional numeration. We now know that the word is merely a corruption of el Khwarezmi, the name of the Arabian mathematician of the 9th century, whose book, in Latin translation, was the first work on this subject to reach Western Europe. Today, when positional numeration has become a part of our daily life, it seems that the superiority of this method, the compactness of its notation, the ease and elegance it introduced in calculations, should have assured the rapid and sweeping acceptance of it. In reality, the transition, far from being immediate, extended over long centuries. The struggle between the abacists, who defended the old traditions, and the algorists, who advocated the reform, lasted from the 11th to the 15th century and went through all the usual stages of obscurantism and reaction. In some places, Arabic numerals were banned from official documents. In others, the art was prohibited altogether. 
and, as usual, prohibition did not succeed in abolishing, but merely served to spread bootlegging, ample evidence of which is found in the 13th century archives of Italy, where, it appears, merchants were using the Arabic numerals as a sort of secret code. Yet for a while, reaction succeeded in arresting the progress and in hampering the development of the new system. Indeed, little of essential value or of lasting influence was contributed to the art of reckoning in these transition centuries. Only the outward appearance of the numerals went through a series of changes, not, however, from any desire for improvement, but because the manuals of these days were handwritten. In fact, the numerals did not assume a stable form until the introduction of printing. It can be added parenthetically that so great was the stabilizing influence of printing that the numerals of today have essentially the same appearance as those of the 15th century. As to the final victory of the algorists, no definite date can be set. We do know that at the beginning of the 16th century, the supremacy of the new numeration was incontestable. Since then, progress was unhampered, so that in the course of the next hundred years, all the rules of operation, both on integers and on common and decimal fractions, reached practically the same scope and form in which they are taught today in our schools. Another century, and the abacists and all they stood for were so completely forgotten that various peoples of Europe began each to regard the positional numeration as its own national achievement. So, for instance, early in the 19th century, we find that Arabic numerals were called in Germany Deutsch, with a view to differentiating them from the Roman, which were recognized as of foreign origin. As to the abacus itself, no traces of it are found in Western Europe during the 18th century. Its reappearance early in the 19th century occurred under very curious circumstances. The mathematician Poncelet, a general under Napoleon, was captured in the Russian campaign and spent many years in Russia as a prisoner of war. Upon returning to France, he brought, among other curios, a Russian abacus. For many years to come, this importation of poncelets was regarded as a great curiosity of barbaric origin. Such examples of national amnesia abound in the history of culture. How many educated people even today know that only 400 years ago, finger counting was the average man's only means of calculating, while the counting board was accessible only to the professional calculators of the time? Conceived in all probability as the symbol for an empty column on a counting board, the Indian sunya was destined to become the turning point in a development without which the progress of modern science, industry, or commerce is inconceivable. And the influence of this great discovery was by no means confined to arithmetic. By paving the way to a generalized number concept, it played just as fundamental a role in practically every branch of mathematics. In the history of culture, the discovery of zero will always stand out as one of the greatest single achievements of the human race. A great discovery, yes, but like so many other early discoveries which have profoundly affected the life of the race, not the reward of painstaking research, but a gift from blind chance.